Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. We go through 18, 18 through 29 tonight. For we are not come unto the mount that might be touched. We are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the words should not be spoken to them any more, For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if, if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken and remain. Wherefore we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Now what did that say? <laughs> Sounded like Greek, didn't it? I mean, when I first read it, uh, I, I, I got through and I shook my head and I said, what in the world was he saying there? It seems like it's a little bit of a difficult passage for, for a little bit, but when you get to study, sometimes, you know, we have a mental block to something that's new or unfamiliar. And, uh, you know, I don't know. They say folks my age are scared to death of computers. <laughs> well, I look at the one at our house. I don't know how to operate it. I think maybe I could turn the switch on. I'm not sure. But uh, we got a new coffee machine here at the church. Did you know that? It's, it's not an expensive one, but it's a nice one. Anyway, uh, I thought, well, I'll just dump it into the room over there, and they'll fix it up and get it all running. Uh, Kind of, I didn't want to have to worry about reading the book. I come here two or three days later, and all he did was took it out of the box. It's still sitting there. And then we got a new cartridge for it, and I, I dumped that in there, and I thought, well, maybe they'll put it in, and I can come down and run a copy off. And, you know, Sister Sandra's pretty smart, but I tell you, all she did was took it out of the box. And that was still in the aluminum folder. So today, I came around, and I wrestled and wrestled with that thing for about 45 minutes. Of course, as simple as ABC, they got a little bracket you shove that cartridge in and shut the lid down and punch the button and your copies come out, you know. But for a while, it intimidated me because we're just so afraid of something new. <laughs> Most of us are, aren't we? You know, now, good, now, you know, God in many ways is pretty profound and, uh, and a mystery to us. I have not figured out yet why God has allowed it to rain every day this year. It's just a mystery to me. I mean, over here. I hadn't figured that out yet. I just, I know he knows. And I'm putting it in his hands. But I'll tell you, my stuff, as far as I can see, don't need any more water. They're drowning, and they won't grow, and the tomatoes won't do anything. And You know, it's all, anyway, the Lord knows. And when I, when I look at God, he is very profound in many respects. And I have not gotten over this awful, awesome cyclone that struck Bengal Dash a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks by now. And uh, I saw the picture before, but I saw it again yesterday of the bodies of dogs and cows and cats and people and babies and kids and all kind of animals all just strung out there, all dead. It's 130,000 people. Uh, I, I just can't imagine uh, that. It, that's, uh, God is an awesome God. If we th say he's in control of the weather, well, he has certainly allowed that cyclone to, to go there. Uh, he is consuming in his power, infinite in his character. 
And uh, so sometimes, to some extent, we just get bewildered and, and it kind of bothers us because we can't figure God out a lot of times. And uh, we, we say, well, we, we, we like to have things all packaged up and, and uh, you know, uh, understandable. That's one thing I like about that bread machine you folks gave her. <laughs> but all you have to do is dump a little... Uh, 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 yeast and you dump well it's a, a teaspoon and a half of yeast uh, no it's two and a half teaspoons of yeast three cups of flour and uh, 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 two and a half teaspoons of dried powdered milk and uh, you close the lid and punch the button and you come back three hours later and you got good hot bread I like it like that I got aggravated this air conditioner you're supposed to just flip the switch and it cools off but it started leaking and fooling around up there. You know, we like things that are packaged and understandable. So since our minds are so finite, then God cannot be confined to our minds. So we get to the point where we don't comprehend him sometimes and uh, like the nature of God. So we just tend to set him aside a little bit sometimes and just go our own way because, well, I don't understand that. So I'll just do my own thing, you know. Uh, we just live in a world apart from God. Our text tonight is given to us to jar us back to uh, not overlooking the awesomeness of God and the consuming power of our God. Now we spent two Wednesday nights in chapter 12 already and you realize that the first part of it is focusing upon a race and we're in, we are encouraged as runners to run this way, race with what? Patience and endurance. That's pretty much the same thing. Just putting up with it, running with it. And now in our text, we come across two mountains here. The writer describes the scenery that surrounds these two mountains. Now, we can tell whether we, when we run in this race, if we're on the right track or not, on the right road or not, by the scenery that surrounds these mountains. Now, the first mountain is Mount Sinai that you read here. And I want to read verses 18 through 21 again from the NIV, New International Version of the Bible. I think it'll help us to realize what he's talking about a little bit. Verse 18, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, to gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words, so that those that heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. Even if even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I tremble in fear. Now you notice he's telling us here that we have not come to such a mountain as that. I'm going to go back to Exodus, the 19th chapter, just to help us to understand a little bit about what Mount Sinai was like as far as the Israelites were concerned. That when God uh, had an occasion that he wanted to meet with uh, the people of Israel, and he called Moses and talked to Moses, and he said, now assemble the people for a meeting with me at Mount Sinai. And you know what he said to them? Uh, I'm just not reading the... Um, the scripture per se, I'm just uh, going to follow along with it here. Uh, it starts with verse, um, chapter 19. I'm in Leviticus. Let me get to Exodus. Exodus chapter 19. And uh, he tells them here, uh, sanctify the people for three days. That means before God can meet with them, he's got to set them apart for three days. Command them to wash their clothes. Have them ready on the third day and set bounds around the mountain so that they may not come too close to the mountain that I'm going to dwell in. And then he says, permit no person or beast to go up into the mountain or touch it. When the trumpet sounds loud, have them draw near the mount, but they better not touch it. They are, they are to come, uh, they're not to be as husband and wife, but come individually here. And if anyone touches it or, or a beast touches it, they are to be stoned or shot through with an arrow. And uh, that's the way it went. And uh, whether they could smell the fire and the smoke, it doesn't say. But fire and smoke was there. And the death penalty, penalty was passed upon any man or beast that touched it. And of course, by stone or an arrow. That was a pretty awesome thing, don't you think? 
God came down to that place. Even to the Moses had talked with God before face to face. But he shook and trembled and quaked under the presence of God there. So the writer was saying to us in Hebrews now. Now after describing all that. You have not come to this type of mountain. So you don't need to run this race scared. You have not come to a mountain that cannot be touched. You've not come to this kind of a fearful thing. But what have you come to? Again, in the NIV, started with chapter 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, a city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Have you thought about that? Notice the picturesque words here. They symbolize a life of freedom. Hallelujah. They symbolize a, a, a life of freedom in the presence of of the almighty God. Haven't we rejoiced in the presence of the Lord. Many times around this place. Not fearing and quaking. Before a Mount Sinai. But a feeling of freedom and rejoicing. In the presence of God. Hallelujah. You notice the, the people that are gathered around here. Uh, all of these things symbolize. The love and the affection of God. And they are rejoicing. There are no borders. There are no threats. Like there was at Mount Sinai. We meet face to face with the judge. How can we do that? By the mediator through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's what makes it possible. No longer is it thou shalt or thou shalt not. The law of liberty has set us free. We live under a new arrangement. Because we are in Christ Jesus who is righteous. Hallelujah. And so you notice here that we are members of the church of the firstborn. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know if you know what that means or not. But this church is the church of the firstborn, not the Old Testament church. Hallelujah. Our covenant is better than the Old Testament covenant. Jesus Christ is better than Adam. Hallelujah. And we are members of the church of the firstborn here. And uh, here we can uh, assemble. Actually, we have come to where the angels are rejoicing. Well, when one sinner comes to the altar and repent, how happy do you get? You know why you get so happy? One of the reasons, because angels are happy too. And they're all around about us. And if you got a host of heavenly angels rejoicing, why wouldn't we rejoice? I believe the angels were in this worship service here tonight. I believe Jesus Christ was in this worship service tonight. Hallelujah. That's why we could feel something from the Lord. We've not come to threats. We've not come to something forbidding and, and threatening, but we've come into the presence of the Lord, to the church of the firstborn, in the presence of angels who are joyfully worshiping and assembled before the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We hear in, in a new covenant that doesn't say, thou shalt this and thou shalt that, or thou shalt not this and thou shalt not that, but whom the Spirit has made free is free indeed. Doesn't the Bible say that? Hallelujah. There's a liberty. Praise the Lord. We have come to the place that's been sprinkled by blood that's better than Abel's blood. And he was righteous. Hallelujah. We've come to the mountain of grace. We've come to the mountain of grace. What's grace? Unmerited favor. We don't deserve it. But the Lord has reserved this better covenant for me and you. I don't know why he didn't pour out this wonderful spirit upon Elijah or Elisha or Isaac or Isaiah or Joel or Daniel. I mean, you read about the life of Daniel or the life of Joseph and uh, it seems like they deserved this more than we did. Besides, uh, actually, no one deserved what we got. Thank God for his grace. Hallelujah. No one deserved, hallelujah, to be filled with his spirit and speak in other tongues. But we have the grace of God. Now, 
The apostle, the apostle who wrote this book here told us these two things here. We have something so much better, Mount Zion, so much better than Mount Sinai. The liberty, the freedom, the rejoicing, not the threats or the foreboding or the blackness or the smoke of the fire or the trembling of the quaking, but where we can just rejoice in the presence of the Lord, worship Him. So, since He's told us that, He's given us a warning here. Now I want to read verses 25 through 29. And this is the warning. He says, See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of that of what can be shaken that is created things so that so that what cannot be shaken may remain therefore since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire you know what that uh, warning is to tell the truth, if we'll be honest with ourselves, our tendency when approaching the mountain of grace is to change certain things because of the freedom we enjoy. We come to the mountain of grace and we, freedom, liberty, and we tend to change certain things because of the freedom we have. When laws are set aside and when rules are put away, we tend to write our own laws and make our own rules. Give you just a little simple example. Supposing you are driving a Mack truck down Airline Highway and the traffic light is out at Burnside and Airline. What you gonna do? Just bulldoze your way on through? You gonna make your own law, aren't you? That law, that light is set aside. And you got the power just to, well, no matter what hits you, you probably make it on through pretty good. That's right. Uh, you know, uh, well, you take the speed limit down on the interstate, and what are you going to do? You're going to set your own law, aren't you? And I guarantee you, you won't be 65 either. I didn't give you the title of this message, Sister Walburn, are you listening? Our awesome consuming God. Our awesome and consuming God. And the focal point, the central point that I've come to right now is don't take advantage of grace. Don't take advantage of grace. That's why verses 25 through 29 appear as a final warning in this book of Hebrews. We are not to lower God's standards to human standards just because we're great. Now some people say, well, the grace of God will cover it. The love of God will cover it. No, we're not to lower God's standards to human standards just because we come to the mountain of grace. We don't deserve His favor, but He's given us His favor. So sometimes we have a tendency to take advantage. Well, that's human nature, isn't it? You've heard to say, you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. You know who will do that every time? Your kid. You know it, don't you? Well, it looks like God's kids do that too. But that's why the warning is here. Yes, you don't have to be afraid. As far, you're not approaching a Mount Sinai. There's not an arrow going to be shot through you because you touched the mountain. Or you're not going to be stoned because you touched the mountain. You're at the mountain of grace where there's, you don't have to fear. God's showing you his love and his grace and his affection there. You're rejoicing with the angels. You're enjoying the presence of God. You're members of the church of the firstborn. You have a liberty to worship God. Don't take advantage of that and just do whatever you want to do. Just because God does not say, thou shalt not. Well, that gives me license to do it. 
Just because God does not say thou shalt. Well then I don't have to do it. He didn't say I had to. Don't take advantage of grace. Hallelujah. Although we have a new covenant. The character of God remains the same. You know God does not change. It tells us that in the Old Testament. It tells us in the New Testament. God does not change. And we do have a new covenant. We do have a better covenant. We do have grace. We do have freedom. We do have a spirit of liberty. We do. We can rejoice. Hallelujah. In the presence of God. But God's character still remains the same. Don't forget it. Just because the Ten Commandments are not written down on stone for us to follow all the time. Grace does not alter our responsibility to be obedient. Grace does not change our responsibility to be obedient. Don't shrug your shoulders, shoulders and say, oh well, I can repent. Grace does not give us the right to do things that we know are contrary to the word, will of God. The word of God. I want to mention a few little things here that uh, you might think is tacky. But I think we need it every once in a while. Just because we shout around here and run the aisles and uh, sometimes we march around the altar and sometimes we dance and what have you doesn't give us the right to just run in and out of the church. Hallelujah. That's petty and tacky, isn't it? Nobody needs to go get a drink of water while service is going on. You're not going to die of thirst in an hour and a half or two hours. No matter how hot it is. Hallelujah. And hardly anybody needs to go to the restroom. Most of you can go before church starts and you can go after church over. Most everybody here can wait an hour and a half or two hours without going to the restroom. Even the children can do it. Just because we enter into the presence of God and run around in a victory march and shout and jump and dance. Liberty in the presence of God. Don't forget the reverence and the respect for the house of God and the presence of God. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, and how about uh, talking to people? I know once in a while you got to say something, you know, once in a while. I mean, it's going to kill you if our tongue don't wag a little bit. Uh, I know. But sometimes some of you keep a constant chatter all through the service. I'm the only one supposed to do that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now that took all my punch out of my sermon, didn't it? <laughs> but anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. And throwing paper on the, just because we got a janitor. <laughs> I mean, the vice volunteer. And, and littering the floor and all of that. I mean, I realize it. Hey, I'm just too tacky there. Okay, let me get on with something a little more serious. Just because we enjoy the presence and the grace of God, liberty, doesn't give us the right to say whatever we want to say. Oh, she's a liar. We don't have the right to say that. Oh, he's sneaky. We don't have the right to say that. Talking about your brother and your sister in the Lord. Oh, they're just a gossip. You don't have the right to say that. Even if it's true. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. We might get on a shouting message on a Wednesday night sometime or another. Hallelujah. But I'll tell you there's times, and this is a period, when we get down to the grindstone a little bit and we got to grind some of these burrs off. We don't have the right to miss church just for any old reason. We need to be here. Hallelujah. Your church. Praise the Lord. You know what? When I was a, and Sister Bernard was a missionary in Korea, and we were gone for four long years, and we'd come home for a missionary rally at Denham Springs, Brother Johnson's church, and you know all our kinfolks in Baton Rouge wouldn't come because it's on their church night. It was on their church night. They hadn't been in our missionary service in four or five years. But it was their church night and they wasn't going to miss and go somewhere else. 
Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, I know of people, their sons went into the ministry, they're members of Baton Rouge Church, and they sent all their tithes to the sons that's in the ministry off somewhere else. But not my kin folks. They pay them all right there to Baton Rouge. They pay their missionary off into Baton Rouge. Whether I got in here or not, or whether she got in or not. And that doesn't mean they don't love us either. But it's their church. And they're standing behind their church. Hallelujah. They want to see their church have revival. They want to see their church grow. They're going to see their church, hallelujah, do something for the Lord. And that's what this church needs is somebody that stays here day in and day out and faithful. And it's my church just because you have the freedom to worship God anywhere in the world doesn't mean that you should not be faithful here where your church and where you belong. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, help me. Just because you have the freedom to worship God and enjoy His blessings doesn't mean that you should neglect giving your tithes and offerings for any reason. Well, the washing machine broke down. We can't wash our clothes. We'll just have to take our tithes and get it fixed. You might not say that. You just simply do it. I don't have a way to get to work. We've got to fix the car. Sorry, church, the tithes and offerings can wait. My pledge can wait. Everything else can wait. Do we have that freedom? If you put God first, I guarantee you he'll take care of these other things. Hallelujah. He feeds the birds, doesn't he? he, he what does he do to the lilies? He makes them pretty and blooming. Hallelujah. And he takes care of all of these things. And he says, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all of these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah. Verse 25 said, do not refuse him who is speaking to you. Now, it's not true. Since we are under grace, God no longer speaks with authority. That's not true. Even if the opposite is true. God's word is more intense now because it's not an earthly Mount Sinai that we've come to. It's a heavenly mountain that we've come to. How much more serious it is. Demonstrations on Mount Sinai were limited to the physical. But Zion is not limited. You notice in verse 26 it says here, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. You know what he's talking about there? And Peter mentioned it, that uh, the earth is going to be renovated with fire. Everything that's created is going to be destroyed and all that, nothing but what's eternal is going to last. And so that's what makes this spiritual thing and this eternal thing much more serious than Mount Sinai as far as God speaking with authority is concerned. Hallelujah. If his word was to be obeyed back then, how much more should it be obeyed now? And it includes his anointed word that's been written by the prophets and the writers of the Old Testament. And it includes the anointed word of your pastor and teachers who are teaching the word of God under the anointing of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. So what should we do? We do need to listen to the voice of the Lord. The Bible says the Holy Ghost shall teach you. Have you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Have you ever felt the Lord or the Spirit of the Holy Ghost check you? Have you ever? Nod your head if you have. Some of you are not nodding your head. Sure you have. You better listen. You better listen. Oh, we got freedom. We're under grace. It's not in the law books. We don't have to do that. But the Holy Ghost is talking to you. The Lord is dealing with you. He says we don't need earthly teachers. He's talking about teachers that are not filled with the Holy Ghost. You do need anointed teachers. Anointed means anointed by the Holy Ghost. So just as the Holy Ghost speaks to you in your mind and in your heart, the Holy Ghost also speaks to you through the anointing of His messengers. And you need to hear and listen. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what. I'd be afraid not to do what my pastor told me to do. If I knew it was not contrary to the word of God. I'll, I'll tell you this. 
I bought, when we were in Korea, uh, I paid a thousand dollar non-refundable ticket down for to come to the States. The day, the midnight of the morning I was supposed to leave. I was supposed to leave that morning. Midnight, the phone came from St. Louis, Foreign Missions Division. You don't have permission to come home. I lost my thousand dollars. You know why I lost it? Because I refused to disobey. I refused to disobey my life. It cost me a thousand dollars not to come home. I could have come home and leave it to them to do whatever they wanted to do. I mean, we had a thriving thing going over there. Surely they wouldn't have pushed us off the field and baptized uh, 500 people at one time. And that's what they want all the time. No, whether I don't know what they would have done, whether they would have done anything or not. I don't know. But my responsibility is to obey, even if it costs me. Even if it costs me. thousand bucks. Praise the Lord. Well, I don't know. I, I, just, I still didn't go hungry. <laughs> the Lord took care of my needs. So anyway, praise the Lord. And, and so we have a responsibility to, to obey the Word of God. Just because we're under grace. Just because we have freedom. Just because we have liberty to worship and shout and feel the presence of God. Does not mean that we put away all the leading and the teachings of the Spirit. But we still have to obey the Word of God. Much more so than they did back there. Another thing, we should show our gratitude, it says in the scripture here. I want you to notice in uh, verse um, 27, uh, the NIV, the word once more indicates removal, removing of what can be shaken, that is created thing, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. What kingdom are we going to receive? What remains? What will remain? You're, you're right. Just not talking loud enough. One is an earthly kingdom that can be removed, but we shall be kings and priests of an eternal kingdom here upon this earth as well as heaven. Hallelujah. And since the children and the people of this kingdom church of the firstborn are to receive an eternal kingdom that cannot be shaken or removed. Since we are to be kings and priests of an eternal kingdom that cannot be shaken and removed, instead of us being contrary and setting aside, I mean, uh, because we don't see some particular law just following our own way, we ought to listen to the words of the Holy Spirit and be thankful and grateful for this precious privilege we have. Embrace grace. Hold on to it. Don't take the grace of God for advantage. Hallelujah. We need to maintain our ability to approach God and see Him fully revealed as awesome. What does awesome mean? Awe-inspiring. Not quaking and trembling at the fierceness and the blackness, but we're all inspired at the wonderful, great God that we have and at the things He's prepared for His saints. Hallelujah. For His children, praise the Lord. And realize that He is a consuming God also. Not only is He awesome, awe-inspiring, He's consuming. If we take advantage of the grace that's been given to us, you can be consumed in his fire. Did this passage make any sense? Sure it does. Sure it does. Thank God we are not in the Old Testament church. Thank God we are not approaching Mount Sinai to come before the Lord. Thank God we do have the freedom to open up our heart right now and feel his presence. Now I never want to take lightly that, op that privilege. I never want to take advantage of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I never want to take advantage of His grace and His mercy. Praise the Lord. I want to embrace. He's granted unmerited favor to me. My responsibility is listen to the voice of God and to be thankful for His blessings always. Not let it become common. That's the danger of a Pentecostal church is letting the things of God 
become common to us. But the altar must always be precious. The baptistry must always be precious. The worship service must always be precious. The reading of the word of God must always be precious to us. Because not only is he an awe-inspiring God, he's also a consuming God. Would you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4? Four, and I want to read in conclusion to this, verses 14 through 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Aren't you glad for the freedom and privilege we have to come to the throne of grace? Shall we stand together right now? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Reach out and touch the Lord as he passes by. You will find he's not too busy to hear your heart's cry. He's passing by this moment your needs to supply reach out and touch the lord as he goes by reach out and touch the lord as